Good morning and welcome to the service today. I'm Gary and um, I've left my glasses at home because we come in Emily's car today, so never mind. I'll try and read this for you. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my innermost being, praise the holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our, your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that you so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Lord Jesus, we thank you um, for the power and the might that is in your name, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that um, we have access to you and heaven because of what Jesus has done. And Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit and we pray that he would be here now with us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. excited to get back into Haggai? Me. All right, let's recap because we missed a Sunday, right? So far in our sermon series, we have learned that the time to build the kingdom of God is now. We are warned not to neglect the house of the Lord as we build our personal lives. We cannot live in paneled houses as they did in Haggai's day while the house of the Lord lies in ruins. We also learned that as physical beings, we cannot separate ourselves from the spiritual. When we foster both our physical and spiritual well-being under the authority of God, we will experience the kingdom life come alive in us. Likewise, we can't exclude God from creation. 
God is still in charge and can at times use creation to wake us up to the need to embrace a life of faith. So the solution to all of the world's problems is to establish a climate of faith. We need more than physical solutions. We need the spiritual needs to be uh, addressed. And as his people, he has chosen, I believe, this time, especially as we journey through Lent, to undertake a renovation project, not only of his physical church, but of us as his people. We need to rebuild our faiths so that we can behold the wondrous work that Jesus wants to complete in our lives. And it's not necessarily going to look pretty at this stage. Remember, we spoke about being in the middle of a renovation project when you're like, am I ever going to see the end of this? In that space, we mustn't give in to disappointment or be trapped in the past. We must be strong and work for the Lord, as Haggai tells the people, for he is with us. We don't need to give in to fear either, because God is our portion. And as Fail says, he's not rebuilding the temple of our imagination, but he's transforming us into the likeness of his son, to be temples of the Holy Spirit. So God has great plans for our broken down houses because he wants to come and live in us. All right, that's the recap. Let's now turn back to chapter two. And this time I'm going to take it a bit by bit because um, it's hard to understand, I think, some of the lines in this portion without um, some context. And again, I'm going to use or draw on the commentator Fail's teaching. So let's go back to chapter 2 from verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. All right, I'm going to stop us there already. (laughs) Strange, you might say, but remember we realized last time that timing is important. So let's see where we are on the timeline here. It's now two months since the last time the prophet had spoken to them. He'd spoken at that time about the need to unite the physical with the spiritual. All right, so we know the timeline. We're two months on since the um, prophet spoke to them. And then verse 11 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. Again, I'm going to stop there. Well, this portion may seem pretty standard. It's actually quite significant. Ask the priests what the law says. Why would God be asking the people to ask the priests about the law? Shouldn't they already be doing this? Do you see? This is why we have to read scripture carefully. There's a sign here. All is not well. The priests are tasked not only with proclaiming the law, but they have been tasked with teaching the people how to live their lives according to it. So it seems like there's some kind of disconnect that is happening here for God's people. And God is seeking to remind them of this and to get the priests involved in the solution. Fast forward to today. My job is not just to preach to you and then we all go home and forget what was said. My job is to teach you how to live out your faith every day, not only in a practical sense, but in the spiritual realm as well, with the aim of all of us striving for one thing in our faith, and that is to live holy lives. Living a holy life is the goal of all disciples. We need holiness that is not just exhibited here at church on a Sunday, but is part of our everyday life, where faith actually becomes a living process. And if we don't do that effectively, if we're not combining the physical with the spiritual, um, then we're going to struggle. We need to understand all the ins and outs of the kind of life God wants us to live. So that when we wake each morning, as we go about our day, we're thinking, how am I living out my faith physically? How am I living out my faith spiritually? These are all aspects to living a kingdom life. And this is why getting to know who God is 
And what his word says on how we are to live is such a crucial part of our lives. And this call by God to the priests was a reminder to them to do what they were called to do, which was not just to run the temple worship. You know, the practical side, like the sacrificing of animals for sin or the marking of holy days, their job was to inspire the people by setting an example of how to live out holiness. And so with that context, we now move to these examples that God gives them. Verse 12, it says, If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that touches some bread or stew or some wine, olive oil, other food, does it become consecrated? Let me translate that to you in modern speak. So God is using an example they are familiar with in the local context to bring across a point. Does your proximity or closeness to something, let's say like this physical wooden cross, make you holy? The answer is no. There's obviously more to faith than its symbols, even though the symbols are important, okay? With that in mind, let's look at this consecrated meat example. So this consecrated meat came from the sacrifices that people had made for their sins at the temple. And the priests were usually allotted a portion of it. It was a way for God to provide for their physical needs, kind of like a a pastor's salary. When receiving the portion of the meat, this was often actually carried in the fold of their garment. Now the question God was asking the priests and the people was meant to help them understand that uh, one needs to go on this path of holiness, and it's not just the things around you that make you holy. The fact that these priests were carrying this consecrated meat didn't somehow transfer holiness onto them, all right? The mere contact of it didn't help there, and so the answer is no. Holiness is not something that can be transferred to us. It's something that has to rise up within us and then be lived out. So another modern day example, let's say the programs we run here at church are not going to make us holy people simply by our involvement in them. These programs are a mechanism to that, a mechanism to learning spiritually how we can take on board all the teachings of God and live that out. So Haggai and God are calling the people to a shift in their thinking, to put weight on these things. And the priests, when asked, agree, and they say no. And then we get to the second example, which helps us understand what we are lacking when it comes to holiness. So let's go to verse 13. Then Haggai said, if a, person defiled, is, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Okay, so according to the law at that time, if you touched a dead body, you became unclean or defiled, as they say here. Now that in and of in That in and of itself is a whole other sermon. (laughs) But the short story here is that we were given commands to protect us from harm, okay? Just like we are called to obedience in the many commands of the Lord, so the people of the day were asked to do the same. God had put boundaries in place for the safe functioning of humankind and to bring fruitfulness to our spiritual lives, And if we ignore that, we do that at our peril. So the focus here is not on the touching of the dead body, which is the mechanism, as it is on the action to disobey something that God had put in place for their protection. You see, this state of uncleanness, in this instance, was a protective measure to prevent the spread of disease. Does that make sense to you now? Okay. They had to understand that if they had acted in that way, there would not only be physical uh, consequences, but also spiritual ones. 
And we can see how this might play out in the physical, right? So death in those days often resulted from sickness and without modern medicine or the, the sanitary systems we have in place today, a dead body could actually pass on sickness to a whole community. Of course, people needed to be buried and handled, but as a precaution, uh, God set in place this rule that you would be unclean for several days so that any spread was limited to those directly involved. So if you disobeyed this, the ramifications uh, could be far spread. Sickness could be throughout the whole uh, uh, entire community. So this was the physical learning that they had to have. And then God used that to teach them a spiritual lesson in holiness. Let's unpack this a bit. God teaches us spiritual lessons through the physical things that happen in our lives. As they say, you can't learn if you don't practice. So God had commanded them these things, and they needed to show that they were listening. <clears throat> and so part of the problem was that they weren't. If they didn't follow this command, they were being disobedient. Okay? So following God's commands is not just physically wise, but it's also spiritually fruitful. Could people live lives in such a way that they were obedient to all the ways of the Lord? Sorry, I've lost my place now. <laughs> so all of God's ways are not just a mechanism. These rules or all these commands are not just a mechanism to preserve us physically, but to teach us how to grow in holiness through obedience. And so let me remind you, have you ever tried to be obedient to something that God has asked you to do when you don't like it? How does that feel? It's not good, right? There's this struggle that happens when you're trying to bring your will in line with what God's will is. And sometimes we can fall off the rails. But if we allow God into this process to help us, we get growth. We grow th growth in spiritual maturity, which will amaze you. And you will be empowered to do so many things in the physical that you never thought possible if you learn this lesson. It's not the only lesson that needs to be learned, but the things you dis it's, sorry, it's not only the physical lesson that needs to be learned, but the things you discover about yourself spiritually on that journey. So here we see a reinforcement of the message that as believers, we can't separate the physical from the spiritual. For a kingdom life has to come with those two things combined. And yet, we live in a world where often we are told the secular has to be separate from the church. Big warning bells. God is being removed from every aspect of life from the classroom, from the workplace, just about everywhere you look, God is being removed. And so God's people are called to exhibit holiness in this environment. And we have to be the examples for others. And so we have to change our thinking so that we do integrate every aspect of the spiritual into our physical lives. This is how we will build the church, and this is how we will participate in what he is doing, you know, as he brings this renovation of our faith to life. Verse 14, Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord, whatever they do and whatever they offer, there is defiled. So the priests had failed and the people had failed to see the holiness of God and what was asked of them. That it didn't come from their building project, but it came from their hearts as the transformed people of God. God was saying, add holiness back into what you do. And then, and then as they say, you're cooking with gas. God is saying to the people, you are not my holy people as I have called you to be. You've forgotten what I've taught you, and you're living life in the physical without consideration for my ways. 
And so whatever you do, whatever you're offering, actually falls short. You could say in a sense it's defiled. Let's read what he says next from verse 15. Now give careful thought. This is said twice in this passage. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there was only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. In other words, God is saying, perhaps the reason you're finding life such a struggle is that you're failing to incorporate me, God, into your situation. So when God is a part of that, even when it's hard, when we're in that process of learning lessons, we are still under his protection, sorry, his protection and blessing. If we leave him out of that process, what happens? It leads to poor choices, which causes all this woe that we find in life sometimes, and we don't reach the fullest potential that God has called us to. We need to come under God's teaching, not only so that we succeed in the, spiritual, in the physical, sorry, but also that we grow in holiness as we wrestle and submit to the teachings of God in our lives. And here's the thing. We are now under the priesthood of Jesus. And he, what he has done for us is everything. We are able to live a life of fullness in the physical and in the spiritual as long as we are willing to be led by him. Like in the days of Haggai, his spirit will gently call to us in the suffering that results from our dysfunction until we wake up to the reality of the fact that we've omitted him from the picture. God is all about making us better. He will use our mistakes not to condemn us, but to teach us a better way. He says, add me back into these situations and the fruitfulness that you think wasn't possible will reach its fullest potential. Notice in this passage where God is disciplining his people, he is not cruel. You know why? They turned to the wine vat for 50 measures and they only got 20. They were not without wine. They had what they needed, but not necessarily what they wanted. And they could be a stubborn people, just as we are stubborn people. And so even when God sent nature to t wake them up, blight, mildew, hail, they didn't listen. And so God had to send Haggai again. This message should give us pause for reflection. Are there areas of our lives where we are ignoring God's involvement in the spiritual? Are we so stuck in our ways that we fail to see that God wants to teach his people to be a holy nation through the practical things we are doing each day. I think it's important to define suffering in this context, right? I believe on earth there are three types of suffering. There is tragedy when bad things happen to good people, as they say. And so this is not what Haggai is talking about. But we all know there is suffering which we inflict on ourselves through our poor choices and through ignoring God's way and will for our lives. And this is where Haggai's message is important for us. And then, of course, there's suffering that comes from following Christ and being persecuted for the gospel. This suffering has a cost, but it's worth it because we experience the miraculous provision of God in the midst of our trials. 
If you have reached the persecution phase of life, that's usually a sign that you're developing your holiness because it's being tested. It's a sign that you are progressing in maturity and that we can take as a blessing and an affirmation that we are on the right path. I think it's important to know these facts as we reflect on the often painful areas of our lives and determine where have I kept God out of it. Finally, this portion of scripture ends with this reassurance from God. From this day on, I will bless you. Fail writes, a love for earthly possessions and security has gripped the hearts of the returning exiles. That is not to say that these things are not important, but we should never place our trust in earthly security, for we will surely be disappointed. God is the author of everything good. Even if we achieve all these things, they are only a fraction of the blessing that God wants to bestow upon his people. The promise of blessing is a call to radical faith which is needed now more than ever. We are the priesthood of all believers, and it is our role to teach others who are not yet aware of what it means to live out a kingdom life. But we can't do that. We can't rebuild the church if we are broken down people. We have to take on this challenge to live a holy life under God's rule and blessing. And then the people around us will begin to see God's involvement in the things that we do. And they'll begin to ask questions. This is what will cause revival in our generation. We constantly want revival, but we have to do the work to get there. In Haggai's day, it was the middle of the growing season and faith and obedience was needed They needed to see that taking time away from work in the fields to work on the temple would not only mean a better harvest physically, but spiritually. It was not just the building that mattered, but the obedience of the hearts of those that God had called to this journey. And so this is the call to us this week to embark on this journey to holiness. And Lent is a good time to do that. Because yes, we are moving towards Christ's death. But we also have the example of his life. We are living that life now in Lent. And so I just encourage you, take those deep hurts before the Lord. Analyze them. Figure it out. Is this a tragedy? Can God bring healing? Is this me, Lord? Help me toward holiness. Am I facing persecution? Yes, Lord, I'm on the journey. I'm doing the right thing. I'm growing in holiness. And this is a sign. Praise you. Thank you. I ask for your provision in that space as well. All right? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, as we've been singing this morning, there's been a common message that we as your people want to keep you in the highest place in our lives. Lord, sometimes we are so oblivious to the spiritual when we are doing physical things. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to teach us how to navigate that space, reconnecting you into those spaces in our lives, Lord. Teach us to be your holy, your holy people. By your Holy Spirit, empower us to face these challenges and overcome them. Lord, help us <clears throat> to bend our will to your will, as Jesus did. Not my will, but your will. Grow us as your people, Lord. <clears throat> Protect us in that space where we're vulnerable. Help us to be honest with ourselves, especially about the things where we need to change. Thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for your love that always awaits us. Thank you for your provision for all the things that we need. 
Help us to reach our fullest potential in you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll do communion now. Yeah. Dear friends, we are on our Lent journey. We are going to Jerusalem with Jesus. He is our pardon, our healing, and our peace. We will suffer the trial with him, resisting evil. With him we will, pour, we will walk the path to life. But we need to come first to this table, for there is food for the journey here. With hearts full of joy we come and we give thanks to our God and our maker and we offer him our praise. We remember Jesus. He fasted and prayed. He was tempted and tried. He relied on the Father for everything. He was obedient to you, God, and scorned by the powers of this world. He confounded the haughty and gave hope to the humble. He was betrayed and deserted. He died between thieves and was buried in a borrowed grave. You gave him new life. He lives even now, our healer and friend. He loved us well, loved us to the end, and loves us still. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come, make all things new. Bless, bless this bread which you have given and human hands have made. Let it become for us the bread of life. Bless also this cup, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. Let it become for us the cup of salvation. Bless us also who eat and drink, that in this sharing we may know the living Christ, who is with us now and to the end of the age. Amen. And while they were eating... Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. And then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Here yeah, we're bringing the practical and the spiritual together. You see, what a wonderful ritual. The Lord is risen. And because of that, holiness can rise up in us. Amen. Mm -hmm. 